Anyway, welcome back. I'm glad you're here. This is week four. We're over the hump. And now uh, the next three weeks, uh, today and the next two weeks, I'm going to get into promises that are specific to the issues that you raised that first and second week when I asked you to submit some things that you've been praying about, that you're troubled by, that you could use a word from the Lord. And so um, uh, that's what we're going to do tonight. Well, that's what we're going to do for the rest of the time. And in addition, in the final session, I'm going to talk about the promises about eternity for us as believers um, and finish up with um, the promises around hope and comfort and peace and joy and laughter. So we're going to end on a, on a high note. Um, so anyway, glad you're here. Um, the divine promises of God are rich in content and endless in variety. I hope you're beginning to see that. Um, there is a promise for every need, for every circumstance of life, body, mind, and spirit. They are scattered throughout the Bible like diamonds in a mine of gold. I hope that in your regular Bible studies or classes, you're now starting to recognize a promise of God. Sometimes it's an I will or we will. Um, sometimes there's other language um, that's an assurance. An assurance would be the equivalent without maybe the will word, but they're everywhere. Remember 7,000 plus of them. So, you know, beginning to have a keen eye to recognize them. Um, some are directed at specific individuals, but all of them are relevant to all of us today. They, you know, and I'm going to read several passages, two passages, one passage from the Old Testament and some New Testament, but nevertheless, that was 2000 plus years ago, and they're relevant for us today. Um, collectively, these promises remind us of a will um, established provision store, a store that you can go buy anything you need. So whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're struggling with, whatever is heavy on your mind, there is a promise for it somewhere in the Bible. And so my hope is that I'm making you curious about these promises and how you can go about when you get in that situation, rather than depending on the information from the world or from Wikipedia or from Google, that you turn first to God's promise and say, what does he say? What does the Lord say about this situation? If you start to do that, you will have pleased me and the Lord greatly because you are going to his word in your time of need. It becomes relevant for you. The promises ensure us peace and joy and comfort in a world which is difficult to live in. They help us deal with life's afflictions, um, like I said, any circumstance can be relevant for, there's a promise for that. Warren Wearsby says, when our faith is tested, God's promises can help us bear the unbearable, do the unreasonable, and expect the impossible. What can promises mean for us? Imagine that you are a vessel of some kind, a, an urn or a bucket or a glass or a cup, and water just drips in one drip at a time. And these promises, as you begin to learn them and you begin to re just think about them and ponder them and reflect on them, you begin to fill yourself with these promises. You might not know the exact language. You might not know the exact address, but you have a sense of what God has promised to you, the assurance and the certainty that he has for you. Um, John 16, verse 33, in this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties, but take heart. I've conquered the world. I've told you all this so that in trusting me, in trusting my promises, in trusting who I am, you will be unshakable, assured, and deeply at peace. And we all want that in life. So the topic that most of you wanted to hear a word on was hope for the unbeliever. Families, it was children, it was friends, um, where it's become a real burden for you when you see somebody, especially somebody that grew up in the church and has fallen away. So what does the Bible say about that? So five of you had that as your primary thing you wanted to hear about. 
You may be familiar with the proverb in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I am a quilter. I haven't quilted in a while, but whenever I make a baby quilt, I put that scripture on the backside of the baby quilt. But some have taken this to mean that if you train a child properly, it is guaranteed that they will follow the Lord. The corollary is that the child goes astray, you're a bad parent, the parent is to blame. But Proverbs are not ironclad promises. They're general maxims about, about life. It's generally true that if you drain up, train up children properly, they will follow the Lord as adults, but it is not a guaranteed promise. And therefore it is not a sign of parental failure when a child rebels. Children's, children, teens and adults are besieged with messages from the world that confuse them, that distort their view of right and wrong, influence them from Satan, where they can easily be lured away. That is a fact of the world we live in, but not just now, it's always been that way. Um, we are not responsible for another person's salvation. We are only to tell them about the gospel. We are to model it in our everyday life. But God is the one who draws people to himself and he makes the seed grow. First Corinthians 6, 6 says, Paul planted the seed in your hearts and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It is not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed to grow. We are told that if a person truly trusted in Christ and accepted him as Lord and Savior, he or she cannot lose their salvation. They may lose rewards in heaven and experience serious consequences in life, but their salvation is assured. Second Timothy 10 through chapter two, verses 10 through 13 says, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So here's a good question. How do we know if someone is saved? And the answer is we don't. We don't. Only God knows. We can observe somebody accepting Christ. We can observe somebody going to the altar and making a confession of faith. We can observe somebody being baptized, immersion, adult baptism, but we really don't know. We can come to some conclusions on how they live their life, but only God knows the real answer about salvation. The worst thing we can do, there's a couple chastisements I'm gonna give you tonight. The worst thing we can do is to pass judgment on someone assuming we know. And we'll talk about this in a little while. We do know that God does not delight or take pleasure in the destruction of those who have not accepted him. His desire is for all men and women to be saved. Now, even though we, re we know the world is getting um, more sinful and more things point to people accepting evil as a way of life, um, and we, 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 those of us that are believers want the Jesus to come again and want him to reign and rule and get rid of all this sin. But the delay in God's judgment is due to his patience and his desire for men and women to be saved. And until each person goes to their death, there is always a chance that they will repent and turn their lives over to Christ. We hear of deathbed confessions. And they are real. And if somebody says that from their heart, then it is a true confession of faith. And as we know, sadly, oftentimes God will allow sin, illness, tragedy to prevail and spin out of control in someone's life until they realize their lostness and recognize their need for God and his love. So those of you that are praying for someone who is lost or has walked away from the faith, it should be no surprise to you if some calamity comes into their life, because that may be the very thing that God uses to draw them to himself.
that's what drew me to the Lord was my own self-imposed calamity. Second Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord isn't being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. So the question you might be asking is, is there hope for my loved one? To answer that, I'm going to take a passage out of John chapter 11, starting in verse one. Debbie, you'll recognize this as a passage we studied in class on Sunday. It is familiar, but I'm not going to use it in the context that you normally read this passage. I'm going to take some liberties, and I hope I don't offend any of you that are um, very, very literal with the Bible. Um, but it really impacted both me and my husband when we, he knew what I was teaching on this week. And when we heard the lesson that was given by our teacher, Leah, it was like, oh my gosh, this is it. So, so, so turn in your Bibles to John chapter 11, verse one. John chapter 11, verse one. It's the fourth gospel. You know the story. I'm gonna skip a few verses. A man named Lazarus was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. Verse three, so the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. Now we don't know what Lazarus's sickness was, but this is where I'm going to take some liberties and suggest for the purposes of our lesson today that the sickness was that Lazarus had fallen away from God. Now, that's not true. Okay, but let's pretend, let's just use that as a story and see if it fits for you. That his sickness was spiritual in nature, not physical. That once he had faith in God and his friend, Jesus, but no longer did. And here's where maybe you can put the name of a loved one in, somebody that has fallen away. Verse four, but when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus's sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God so that the son of God will receive glory from this. Remember, as believers, everything we do should bring glory to God. Even the difficult circumstances of life that causes pain and suffering will often, almost always bring glory to God. Before Jesus got there, Lazarus apparently died. So although Jesus loved, this is verse five, although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. He just backed off. Finally, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? Although the disciples were concerned about Jesus' safety, they were really saying, why bother? He's already, he may already be dead. If you are waiting for someone to accept Christ or return to him, some may say it's hopeless. It's been too long. He or she is married to an atheist. He or she has said horrible things about God and Jesus, swearing to never, ever, ever again set foot in a church. Some friends may say that. Some friends may say, why bother? I don't want you to get your hopes up. Jesus replied in verse nine, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. But at night, there is danger of stumbling because they, they have no light. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. Remember, Lazarus, remember, Jesus, like God, is omniscient. Although he had not yet visited Lazarus, he knew that Lazarus had already died. But he simply said, he's fallen asleep. The second point in these verses is about God's timing. Notice that Jesus sat with his disciples for two days before even suggesting a journey to Judea. It just wasn't the right time. Why? because there was an even bigger agenda at hand. In this case, Jesus waited on the healing because he knew it would be more glorifying to God. 
If there is pain, even if there is pain and suffering, God may wait on healing until the appointed time because it will be more glorifying to God. In this case, waiting four days after someone died was unheard of. Even the Jewish law specified that after four days, four days after death, the corpse was absolutely dead. But notice the disciples still have hope. Verse 12, the disciples said, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will soon get better. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleep, sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sakes, I've, I've, I'm glad it wasn't, I wasn't there, for now you will really believe. Had I gone there and instantly healed him, there would have been no miracle. There would have been no big story to tell. But by my waiting, by my being intentional in the waiting, there's a big story to tell. And that big story is what God can do. Come, let us go see him, Jesus says. Here we see that the delay timing was intentional. And it was a teachable moment for the disciples. Mary and Martha and the other friends, meanwhile, had assembled at Lazarus's home. But Jesus had a higher priority than the healing. Verse 17. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Mary and Martha in their loss. So now there's a crowd, people coming to see Jesus is coming. What will he do? That's his friend. Verse 20. When Martha got the word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. But Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But now, even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. So there's a bit of criticism, but there's also a bit of hope. Here we see Martha in a period of faith that Jesus could heal, but doubt. Could Jesus raise him from the dead? She was sure that if Jesus had been present, her brother never would have died. And you can imagine it would not only be sad for her to lose her brother, but angry or disappointed in Jesus for not coming there sooner. Verse 23, Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Verse 24, yes, Martha said he will rise when everybody else rises on the last day. Again, Martha is limited in what she believes. She couldn't even imagine Lazarus rising that day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live, even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who came into the world from God. Then she returned to Mary called Mary aside and said, the teacher is here and he wants to see you. So Mary immediately went to see him. When the people, verse 31, when the people were at the house consoling Mary, they saw her leave hastily. They assumed she was going to Jesus' grave to weep. So they followed her there. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said the exact same thing Martha had said. Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Both sisters were disappointed in Jesus and his lack of urgency. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people wailing with her, a deep anger welled up within him and he was deeply troubled. Where have you put him? He asked them. They told him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. The people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved him. But some said the man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was still angry as he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. And he said, roll the stone aside. But Martha, the dead man's sister protested, Lord, he has been dead for four days. The smell will be terrible. The King James version says, he stinketh. Jesus responded in verse 40, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? So they rolled the stone aside and Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here. So they will believe you sent me. Therein lies the purpose of the delay. The miracle of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead and doing it publicly. Jesus wanted as many people as possible to see this happen, and also that he did nothing without the Father's approval. 
Verse 43 wraps it up. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a headcloth. And Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. Perhaps this is the story of your loved one. Although he or she had been exposed to Christ and his truth, they have now fallen away, fallen asleep, or even died as a child of God. And the time has not yet come for them to have a change of heart. Perhaps it will take a significant event in their life, a devastating diagnosis, a failed relationship, financial ruin, an out of control addiction of some kind. I know that none of us wants that to happen to a friend, a brother, a sister, or a parent. But if it does, and if it brings that person back to Christ, we know that God will be glorified. And we know our loved one will be saved. In fact, the longer a person stays away from God, the more profound the story will be, the more miraculous it will be, the more unbelievable it will be. Yes, there will be years of lost, lost time in terms of fellowship with the Lord, but returning to our Father is all that matters. He will forgive them, he will love them, and extend eternal life to them. So while you and I wait, what do we do and say? What does God do and say? We are to pray without ceasing. We are to pray fervently. For those of you who are in the parable study, do you remember the story of the widow who persisted in hounding the judge who would not hear her case? Scripture tells us that she drove him crazy with her constant pleas to be heard. This is how the Lord wants us to pray. Unceasingly, fervently, and with assurance of an outcome that will bring our loved one back. God will figure out how this will all come about. I know we like to spend a lot of ways trying to orchestrate something like this, but it will not work. This is a God thing. This is not a human thing. We must do our part by making our intentions known to God in earnest and persistent ways. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1, 3, 4, and 5. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Even when they're lost, we are to give thanks for them. This is good and pleases our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, Jesus Christ, who gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. Here's a story from the devotional Words of Hope for Women by Carolyn Larson. It's entitled Hope in God Showing Up. I'm reading from Joshua 10 verses 13 through 14. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down for a full day. There has never been a day like that before or since. When the Lord listened to a human being, surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Here's the story. Joshua's army was fighting a battle that he really wanted to win for the Lord. So he asked God to make the sun stand still, to prolong the daylight hour so his army could defeat God's enemies. What an amazing request. What's even more amazing is that God answered it. He did it. He made the sun stand still in the sky so that Joshua's army could defeat the enemies. God has the power to do anything that pleases him, and nothing pleases him more than his children coming back to him. If you think you would rejoice at the thought of a sister or a brother, a son or a daughter, a parent coming back to Jesus, <clears throat> he, he will be jubilant tenfold. He still has the power to change the mindset of your loved one, to change the circumstances of that life. Perhaps he just needs you to pray more and trust more. Believe it's possible, not pray with doubt, not pray with question, 
not pray with, this will be hard. Pray believing that God will do what he has promised. Verse uh, out of 3 John, verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are following the truth. So we must pray earnestly for our loved ones. But what else? Here's chastisement number two. Christians have a tendency to be hypercritical, self-righteous, and judgmental when we perceive someone has fallen away from the church. But just as we studied, we must change our approach, love them, and pray for them. The worst thing we can do is to be judgmental and self-righteous. So here's a few questions to ask yourself. Can I still be accepting of them despite this decision they have made? Can I still rejoice in who they are? Do they feel my love is genuine or manipulative? Manipulating, bargaining, and pushing will only further push them away. And the evangelists are not going to like what I'm going to say next, but further evangelizing will push them away even further. Until they know you love them, until you kn they know you love them unconditionally, they will not want to hear about your Jesus. So quoting scripture, sending them scripture in the mail, will not be helpful. They know what you believe. You've told them enough. Now it's up to God. This is something you must check yourself on. Don't fall into the trap of being self-righteous or harsh. Those are sins just as well. The third thing we can do while we wait is to love without ceasing, just like the father in the prodigal son story. He loved lavishly. Here's a lovely story from Stephen Cole, an article uh, that was published on Bible.org called A Model for Hurting Parents. The late Joe Bailey was a gentle, godly Christian leader. I once heard him tell how one of his sons rebelled back in the days of the hippie movement. He grew his hair long and he moved into a communal flop house. Late one night, Bailey received a call informing him that his son was being held at the Chicago police station. He got out of bed, got dressed and went down to the station but they had no record of his son being there. He made the rounds to several other police stations thinking maybe it was a mistake, but he realized that the call had been a prank. Even though it was about two in the morning, before he went home, Bailey went to the flop house where his son was living. He went in the unlocked door, stepped over several sleeping bodies strewn on the floor and found his son asleep on his bed. He gently bent over and kissed his son on the cheek before he went home. He never said a word. When Bailey told the story, he said that his son was now a pastor. Years later, the young man told his father, Dad, do you know what turned me around? Bailey said, no, son. He said, it was that night you came into my room and kissed me. You thought that I was asleep, but I wasn't. I thought if my dad loves me that much, I had better get my life right with God. That's the witness we need to give. Even if our loved ones have hurt us with a rebellion, we must show them God's abundant love and mercy. Some other questions to ask yourself. Do I demonstrate this kind of love and acceptance? Is the lavish love that the father uh, offered to both of his sons in the prodigal son story? Do I demonstrate this kind of love and acceptance to my loved one or do I hang salvation over their head? Do I love with the same kind and level of grace that God does? Or do I push because my loved one being saved is the most important thing in the world to me? Could it be said that I have extravagant love for them or some other negative kinds of feelings towards them? Do I think I have more power to convince them to be saved or does Jesus working in their heart? Psalm 103, eight says, we should love them as God does with compassion and grace, being slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Remember, our job is not to judge someone who is saved. Our first job is to teach them about Jesus and pray for them to accept Christ. But if they fall away, 
Our job is to pray for them to have a change of heart, to pray for God to reveal himself to them in profound ways, and to fervently love them and believe that God still works miracles while you patiently wait. You must believe he can. This is about your belief. No matter what, preserve the relationship. Believe that the day will come when that person does accept a return to Christ and be ready for it. Make it easy for them to reconcile with you to share their change decision. Don't laud over them like, what took you so long? You've heard me speak about Jesus. When you were a child, you always went to Sunday school. What happened to you? You're just going to push them away again. Preserve the relationship. Be ready. Welcome them with open arms. When that time comes, rejoicing is the only godly response. Not talking about the time wasted or for things they did in the interim. Just rejoice and celebrate. And if there's ever a moment of curiosity when your loved one <clears throat> just might want to know more, I would encourage you, don't preach verses. Don't talk about the way they were as a child. Tell them your testimony. You have one. When God became big to you, when God changed your life, there's a vulnerability there because you're exposing some of maybe what wasn't working so well in your life. God drew you in and he changed you and your heart's been changed forever as a result of that. Testimonies are one of the best ways we can convince people that our Jesus is real and that our lives are different as a result. Isaiah 44, 3 says, for I will pour water on the thirsty ground and send streams coursing through the parched earth. I will pour my spirit into your descendants and my blessing on your children. Second Timothy 1, 5, I am reminded, Paul says to Timothy, of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. Make being a Christian visible, not so verbal. Final verse for this section, John 10, verses 26 through 30. But you don't believe me because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. For my father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anything else, than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. Now, I know that I didn't, I didn't wrap that up with a promise per se, but I want you to know that the Lord knows those who are not saved, those who have left the faith. And I want you to earnestly believe that he listens to you and he will answer your prayers. So that was the first thing you had on your hearts. The second thing was forgiveness, restoration, and mercy. Doesn't get any easier. Paul Tripp, who wrote the devotional I'm using, New Morning Mercies, on June 26, said, so much of our disappointment in relationships is not because we have an unrealistic view of others, but because we have a distorted view of ourselves. When we are impatient, harsh, <clears throat> critical, judgmental, curt, and unkind, we are revealing more about what we think about ourselves than what we think about them. When we are righteous, we expect others to be righteous as well. So we become demanding, judgmental, and constantly disappointed. Constantly disappointed in others. We must remember, though, that forgiveness and mercy are key elements to the gospel message. In the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples on how to pray and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Then two verses later, Jesus says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, 
your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your father forgive yours. That is a negative promise. If you don't forgive others, he won't forgive you. It's not a small matter to hold someone hostage, not release them from something they've done to you. At the root of it, we must remember we are all sinners. None of us are perfect. You are a sinner. The people you associate with are sinners. The people you live with are sinners. The people in this room are sinners. The people you work with are sinners. The people in traffic are sinners. Even the people we go to church with are sinners. Romans 6.23 tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 3 said there is none righteous, not even one. So I'm going to categorize forgiveness in two ways. The first thing I'm going to talk about is when we have committed a wrong against someone else. That we've done something that we regret, that we wish we had never done, and there's there's a tension, there's an issue, there's a distance, just doesn't feel quite right. So I'm gonna talk about that first. And for that, I'm going to use the parable of the unforgiving debtor, which is in Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. If you would turn there, Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. I'm not taking any liberties with this one. This is straight up. Just before this, Jesus had been telling stories and parables to some of his disciples. Remember, he's preparing them because he knows he's not going to be around much longer. And he continues on the subject of forgiveness between believers. Verse 21 of Matthew 18. Does anyone need a Bible? I have one up here. Okay. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No. Not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times, seven times. Jewish law taught that a person should be give, forgiven a repeated sin three times. But if there was a fourth time, no, forgither, no further forgiveness need to be extended. Peter was probably thinking he was rather generous in giving seven times forgiveness. But Jesus has now corrected Peter's premise. Jesus is saying we are to forgive an unlimited number of times. There is no end to the forgiveness we need to extend to people who have wronged us. Why would he make that statement? He wants us to forgive without keeping count. He wants us to de develop the habit of forgiving so it becomes natural. Not withholding, not raging, not avoiding, but forgiving. Continuing in the Matthew 18 parable, verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. He was just checking his books. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed $10 million, is the calculation in today's currency. Your Bible probably says talents. Verse 25, he couldn't pay. So his master ordered that he be sold into slavery, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned in order to pay the debt. But the man, verse 26, fell down before his master. He begged him for mercy, saying, please be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Now, at first blush, this response seems genuine, but when we take it apart, we learn a bit more about this man. He was full of pride and arrogance. This was a huge sum of money that the man borrowed. Notice that he said he would pay all of it, $10 million, but that was impossible. That amount was so great, it would have taken him 1,600 years to pay that debt back. You have to wonder if he was ever planning to pay it back, and he certainly wouldn't have had he not been found out. He had no repentance for what had happened. He didn't express any regret or shame for the missing money. He only begged for mercy and patience while he got the money together. He didn't seem to be concerned about stealing the money until he got caught. 
and that was only because the master audited the books. His case was hopeless, yet he pleaded to his master for patience to avoid his family being sold into slavery. Verse 27, and his master graciously was filled with pity and released him and forgave him the entire <clears throat> Clearly, this was a generous and compassionate king to forgive such a large debt. The king would have to take the hit for the man's recklessness. And as a result of the king's kindness, the man and his family escaped being thrown into prison for life. Verse 28, but when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. It sounds like he didn't waste any time collecting from a fellow servant. This was an insignificant amount of money compared to what he had taken. But notice what he did next. He grabbed the fellow servant by the throat and he demanded instant payment. Instead of sharing the king's goodness, the benefit that he had received, he mistreated the fellow servant and there was not an ounce of compassion in him. He had no forgiveness, only greed, arrogance, and spite for what would have been considered a very small debt. He demanded payment and he demanded it instantly. Verse 29, his fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. Notice the similarity between the debtor and the servant, the second debtor, the exact same words. They made the same request and they made the same promise. Verse 30, but the creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. This time, notice how differently each of the men were treated. The first debtor, the one who lost millions, had his fellow servant arrested and put into a prison until the debt could be paid in full. He had been forgiven by the king. Should he not spare his friend? We see that he took the forgiveness he had been given for granted. He forgot about his guilt and the king's mercy instantly. And he was not the least bit interested in offering forgiveness to the debtor. Sadly, he learned nothing from the experience. Verse 31, when some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset and they went to the king and they told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Verse 34, then the angry king sent the man to, to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. This was a life sentence. The king was saying, how could you? I forgave you because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have done the same? Just as I had mercy on you? When I first heard this parable, I thought it meant that the man would be locked in jail and tormented by the freedom he had just lost and the separation from his family. That may be true, but I also realized if we have an unforgiving spirit, we are locked in a prison of bitterness and anger, and we are tormented by it. We keep replaying the events. I was right, you were wrong. You had no right, you hurt me. I didn't deserve this. It just festers in us and it won't go away. And as a result, our souls are tormented. Yes, the hurts are real, very real, but holding on will only torment us worse. Forgiveness is about you and your soul and between you and God. And like the forgiving, unforgiving man, if we do not forgive, God will deliver us over the, to the tormentors. Our hurts and wounds will turn into hard feelings, self-pity, bitterness, resentment, and self-righteousness. Each of you knows someone that's bitter and angry because they won't release someone. The parable continues with the main point where Jesus is speaking directly to us. That's what my heavenly father will do to you and me if we refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. There will be no mercy and forgiveness unless you are merciful. You will never be able to pay the debt that God, that you owe God. You cannot be considered a member of God's kingdom without 
being merciful and your witness will be meaningless. So we know, if we know that forgiveness and mercy are so important to God, why is it so hard to do? Well, our ego gets in the way. Our pride gets in the way. I'm going to read you uh, something out of that New Morning Mercies book, devotional on June, 6, June 15. Confession is not natural for us. It's natural for us to think of ourselves as more righteous than we are. It's natural to blame our wrongs on others. It's natural to say our behavior was caused by some difficult circumstance we were in. It's natural to exercise our inner lawyers and defend ourselves when we're confronted with a sin, weakness, or failure. It's natural to turn the tables when being confronted and tell our accusers that they are surely bigger sinners than we are. It's natural to be more concerned about the sin of others than our own. It's natural to be more critical of the attitudes and behavior of others than our own. It's natural for you and me to be blind to the depth of our spiritual need. Because this, this sturdy system of self-righteousness is natural for every sinner, it is unnatural for us to be clear-sighted, humble, self-examining, and ready to confess. Blind eyes and a self-satisfied, self-congratulatory heart stand in the way of the broken heart of confession. We don't grieve sin because we don't see it. It is ironic that we tend to see the righteousness we don't have and fail to see the sin that stains us every single day. It's easy to look back on our lives and see the mess we've made, the people we've hurt. It's tempting to wish we could rewind the clock and have do-overs, taking back the words and actions that were hurtful. It's natural to question why God has taken so long to reveal our sinfulness to us. And if we prepare to, con if we prepare to confess our sins, it can be embarrassing that we've waited so long to do so. We cannot change any of that, but we can do something now to confess our sins, confess our wrongs, how we've hurt others by telling them so. We cannot worry about their reactions. We must simply ask for their forgiveness as we have been commanded to do. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. And we can only hope that the request will be met with grace. I wronged someone in the worst way possible some 40 years ago. When I became a Christian, God helped me to recognize the level of sin I had committed. Yet I never went to that person. I never apologized for how I had wronged them and I asked, nor had I ever asked their forgiveness. I can say all, in all honesty, that situation came to my mind every day, but I never did anything about it. Remember that was 40 years ago. About eight years ago, God made it an issue that I could not ignore. I knew that I must go and see this person and ask their forgiveness. I made the arrangements, I lived in another town, I had to find a place, I had to find a time. The first 30 minutes or so were basic chit chat. How are you? What's new? How are your boys? And then with a trembling voice, I said, I bet you wonder why I wanted to see you. And then I launched into two requests for forgiveness. You see, the person I'd wronged was my ex-husband and secondarily his wife, who I knew quite well. I started the conversation with her because it was easier. She wept with me as I asked for her forgiveness. She clearly remembered what I had done and obviously I had hurt her. She had never told my ex-husband her husband. She kept that inside. And then I directed my comments to my ex-husband. He saw me weeping and held my hand. I then told him that what I had done to him was so wrong and that I was deeply, deeply sorry for hurting him and destroying our marriage. He just looked at me and said, Kathy, that was a lifetime ago. It's okay. By God's grace, he remarried a wonderful woman, the woman that was sitting at the table with us shortly after we divorced and they now have two grown sons. 
Life has been good to him in every respect, including his walk with the Lord. Shortly thereafter, we said our goodbyes and we parted company. Like the man in the parables we just read, I was in my own prison of guilt and shame those 40 years. And only by confessing my sin did God release me. I knew that he had forgiven me, but I had not forgiven myself. But the action of asking for forgiveness and hearing the reply relieved me and gave me peace on the matter. Is it still in my memory? Oh, yeah. Do I still have regrets? Yes, I do. But I have done what God asked of me, despite how hard it was. It's something I needed to do for me, I needed to do for her, and I needed to do for him. So that was the first kind of forgiveness when we've wronged someone and we have to go and express our regret. The second kind is when we have been wronged. We often have a hard time forgiving and releasing the pain of the infraction, so we hang on to it. And it seems like over time we grip tighter and tighter and tighter. We might want to inflict the same kind of pain on the other person, but that is not what we are called to do. We might want to inflict the same kind of hurt on the other person, but that is not what we are called to do either. It wasn't right for any of this to have happened, but it did. We might want to hold on to bitterness and anger because it makes us feel good, but that's not what we are called to do. We are called, commanded to forgive no matter the infraction, no matter how you have been hurt, you are to forgive. For this story, I want to just mention parts of the parable about the lost son. If you recall the story, a man had two sons. He seemed to be a wealthy, a wealthy man, a wealthy farmer. Um, two sons, and one day the younger son came up to him. This is in Luke 15, starting in verse 11, if you want to turn there. Um, but the younger son came to him and said, Father, I, I'm tired of living here. My words, I'm tired of living here. I want my inheritance. I want it now because I'm going to go have fun. And so the father loved him enough to give him his inheritance. He didn't have to but he gave it to him way earlier than he would have gotten it. The same amount he would have gotten. And the son goes off. And what we know happened is that the son went off to what's called a distant country and he squandered every bit of his inheritance. Once he had spent everything, a famine struck the country and he found himself in dire need. That's verse 14, Luke 15. So he hired himself to one of the local citizens and soon he found himself feeding the swine. He longed to even eat the food of the swine, but nobody gave him any food. Coming to his senses, in parentheses I wrote, nudged by the Holy Spirit. He thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough to eat, but here I am dying of hunger. I shall get up. I shall go to my father and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would one of your hired workers. True lament. So he got up and he went back to his father. Remember, he had insulted his father. He had left the family home and he had wasted his inheritance. Verse 20, probably my favorite verse in the whole Bible. But while he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him, was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. And although the son confessed to his father about his wrongs, the father simply ordered his servants, bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fattened calf and slaughter it, and then let's have a great big party because my son who once was lost has been found. Now the older son wasn't too happy about this. When he came in from tending the fields, he saw the party going on and he asked, what was the party for? And was told it was because your younger brother has come home. And he was angry because he knew everything the younger brother had done. <clears throat> and he refused to enter the house. He refused to enter the party. 
But the father said to him, my son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours, but now we must celebrate and rejoice. Your brother was dead and has come to life. He is lost and is now found. The best kind of forgiveness we can give adds kindness to forgiveness. It brings out the best robe, the ring, the sandals, and it kills the fattened calf. It focuses on forgiving the past and restoring the relationship. The father lavished love and forgiveness. Even though the sons had hurt the father, he demonstrated the gracious love of God with both of them and forgave them instantly. This father is a type of Christ, meaning he depicts the sort of forgiveness God has for us. Psalm 103, verses 12 through 18, this is out of the message. <clears throat> God is sheer mercy and grace. I love that, sheer mercy and grace. Not easily angered, he's rich in love. He doesn't endlessly nag and scold, nor hold grudges forever. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve, nor pay us back in full for our wrongs. As high as heaven is over the earth, so strong is his love to those who fear him. As far as the sunrise is from sunset, he has separated us from our sins. To forgive is to extend mercy. It's a high standard, but one we signed up for when we accepted Christ. Ask yourself, is the forgiveness the Father showed similar to the forgiveness I extend to others? Or do I do it begrudgingly or not at all? God is eagerly watching over you and I in this regard. Just as he is ready to pour out his love and mercy on us, he expects us to do the same with others, to demonstrate his compassion, his grace, being slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Is God bringing someone to mind? If he hasn't yet, he will this week. Practice forgiving others. Thank you.